Uh, that was a little joke which I told last week. And I thought, man, oh man, I'm going to trump that one all I can. Uh, you know, when people think of Jesus, they think of many different things. I mean, maybe if, maybe if you just could stop and, con and consider the different things you think of when you think of Jesus. Uh, maybe you'll think about his birth or maybe Christmas. Uh, maybe you'll think about uh, his death. Maybe you'll think about uh, Easter Sunday or something like that. And for all of us, we seem to have our own little, uh, little things that, that just the thought of Jesus reminds us of. And for me personally, I think about his amazing compassion and his sense of purpose. Um, and I say that for two reasons. First off, because Jesus was very directed in what he said. You know, you don't really see him just kind of floundering around. You know, even the different things that he taught and stuff, he, he had a purpose to the things that he said. He didn't just get up there and drone on and on and on. I mean, I've been to a lot of churches where it seems like um, it seems like the pastor doesn't even know what he's preaching about. <laughs> but uh, you know, you don't see that kind of that kind of flow with the things that Jesus talks about. And then I, the same thing that I mentioned earlier, I guess the first thing in reverse order, uh, amazing his amazing compassion, just the way that he that he genuinely cared about people. You know, I find myself oftentimes, you know, um, trying kind of in like a battle of wills between myself and God, like. Do I really want to spend my time to help this person, or would I rather just continue on the project that I'm on? So I'm a very um, introverted kind of person. I don't like to be in front of people. I don't like to talk to people. Uh, I'd rather just say, wow, they're really wrong under my breath and walk on my way. I, I really don't like confrontation, that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, But with Jesus, you don't see him like, uh, okay, fine, I'll heal you. You know, and I think that if it was me, I think that that would, that would be me, you know? And in fact, history has shown us how when people have um, healing abilities, regardless of whether they're legitimate or not, um, they kind of tend to think that they're just God's gift to mankind, and they really sit on their ivory tower. And uh, you don't really see that happen with Jesus, and that just amazes me. So for the next three weeks, we are going to be looking at four specific commands that Jesus gave from the book of Matthew. Um, and these commands really are, are for everyone who loves God and follows Jesus. It's not something that we're just for disciples. These four things are for everyone who, who follows Jesus. Now, Matthew is the first of four accounts in the Bible about Jesus' life. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, Matthew was written by a Jewish um, tax collector, <laughs> which, you know, they're about as loved as they were back then. And he wrote to a Jewish audience. Um, for that reason, uh, he focuses on a lot of uh, things that Mark, Luke, and John really didn't. Um, like, for instance, if you read John, uh, he's got a very, uh, I guess you could say Greek tint to the things that he says. If you read Mark, he's got a very Roman tint. Uh, but if you read Matthew, he, he, he really tries to explain things for a Jewish person. He, he draws more Old Testament passages than any other, uh, than any of the, of the other four Gospels. And he really goes to great lengths to show that Jesus is a rabbi, a teacher. He, it's, that's really, really important in the Gospel of Matthew because, once again, Jewish people were really concerned about the teachers and that kind of stuff. In fact, they were so concerned about what their teachers had to say that they had a heap of rules on top of the, mo of the laws that Moses gave um, to ensure that Moses' laws were not broken. So a lot of stuff going on here. Um, the first command is in Matthew chapter 6. Starting in verse 24 through 25. Now, we're not going to look at the other three commands uh, tonight. Uh, we'll look at them throughout the next uh, three, three Sunday nights. But uh, we'll start here in Matthew 6, 24, going through 25. Um, and it says this, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. And then he goes on in verse 25, For this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life. As to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. So he says this, this neat little thing in the beginning of verse 25. He says, for this reason. See, Pastor brought this up a couple Sundays ago, the way that we have added verses and chapters and paragraph breaks. The original manuscript didn't. In fact, I'll do you one better. The original Greek manuscripts didn't have spaces between the words either. How do you like that? How do you like them apples? <laughs> Try translating something. You want to talk about run-on sentences. I'll give you run-on sentences. <laughs> so what we have now is, is, is not exactly what they wrote. And that's a good thing, because although we have maintained 
the words that were said, we made it readable again. <laughs> because if all our Bibles were still in Greek and not modern Greek, ancient Greek, and not even how they wrote ancient Greek now, boy, oh boy, we'd all be in a deep trouble. <laughs> but, you know, it's okay. Uh, and, and so we have this little phrase there, for this reason. And it's easy to think that for this reason maybe is something we have to invent. But if you look back at verse 24, he tells us the reason. Because we cannot serve two masters, we will glorify one over the other. So for that reason, do not be worried about your life. In other words, it's okay to be all in for God. It's okay to be on for God. So let's go on to the second part I want to look at before we really start getting into this. Verse 32, for the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. He didn't dismiss the idea that we do need, <laughs> you know, food and that kind of stuff. Um, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Um, so right here, just at a glance, we have the first command. Seek God's kingdom and righteousness more than anything. It's a very, very, sim very, very simple command. The thing is, um, it gets complicated in the follow-through. It's not necessarily that we don't understand what he's saying. It's just very difficult <laughs> to do what he's saying. Um, I don't know about you, but at least once a day, I think, of, you know, going on my Amazon wish list and just buying it all. All of it. <laughs> even the things I didn't even know I wanted, all of it. <laughs> you know, and so I can accumulate all my things. But in verse 24, he kind of he kind of warned us about that. Uh, so, you know, and we kind of find ourselves, find ourselves in this place of constant tug of war. So it sounds like a good idea. Okay, see God's kingdom. That's a great idea. But then we wake up on Monday morning and somewhere between Sunday and Monday we lost the connection. We're just not quite sure what that looks like in our real life. Um, now, I, I do have to say that I don't have time to talk about everything he's saying in this passage. Um, there's really a lot going on here. Uh, but we're going to specifically look at the seek part. So, uh, I want to show you a picture that I, I think, not a picture, it's a diagram, uh, a chart, that I think kind of uh, gets my point across. We think when we read this passage of something like this. We have our numbered system. Like this is our this is our daily to do list, right? Uh, I know I, I I love lists. I love making myself to do lists and goals for the day, so I can cross them off as I get them done. I'm like man, oh man, things are going great, and it helps me you know stay on point. So when we when we read this, you know, because we're a Western mindset, we, we think of things a little bit differently than they did back then. So when we say seek first is king, and we think okay, well here's my to do list, and number one seeking God. So I wake up, let's say, in the morning, for instance, and I pray for, I don't know, 30 minutes or something. Okay, that's my, I did my due, due diligence there. So now I'm going to the next thing. Okay, so now I have to seek my, my success. Okay, now the next thing. Now I have to seek money and things. Now the next thing. Now I have to seek power. See what I mean? In, in our heads, that, that sounds like, hey, that's a good idea. But if you stop and just think about what, what, you're, what you're thinking, <laughs> not a great idea. So instead, we try and, we try and do a, an uh-oh, a little cover-up, and it looks something like this. See, I have in, I have boldened the words. That means I'm seeking all of these things, but this one I'm really seeking because of, it's, I bolded it. <laughs> See, mm -hmm. not yes, no, nope. yes. See, well, okay, I got this down. All right, now, but this is a little bit maybe more realistic of what God had in mind. See, God. Now, all these other things. Use your money and time for God. Be a good worker as an example of God and his worship to God. Invest your time and life in other people. Now, hold on. That means that everything's about God. Yes. Yes. And that takes us to this little, little word that is translated as first in most translations. But seek first his kingdom. See, in Greek, let me just say it like this, and I've said this a hundred times. Ancient languages used a lot more imagination in their words than modern English does. Modern English is a very precise language. Um, and ancient languages really didn't have that. And for instance, one word could have a whole slew of different meanings to it. And it would be the same word used, but translated completely differently. And the context would kind of clarify that. Uh, and then also, you know, a word itself, you know, like for instance, we have a word helicopter. That's, you know, that thing that goes in the air with the spitting blade. You know, okay, all right, we all know what we're talking about here. But, you know, if they were trying to describe something very similar, they might just use more description for it instead of just a title. Does that kind of make sense? They, they, they didn't think about the world the same, in the same terms as we do. And, and I encourage you to read things like, you know, the Iliad and the Odyssey, and you kind of start to see how Greek people thought a lot different than we do. Now, 
obviously, um, the Iliad and the Odyssey, that was written in, in a different form of ancient Greek than the Bible was, but I think you'll kind of still get the idea there. The, the word first had, it carries more of the idea of foremost, most importantly. Before you do something else, make sure that, that, that you are doing this. Um, it's, not, it's not first in the sense of um, number to do this, like uh, in order. It's first as in paramount. Does that kind of make sense? Now, once again, you really don't get that in reading the English, and it sounds like, once again, that our broken system of here's my to-do list is going to work, and that's just not what the, what, what, the, what the wording here is implying. It's implying seek God. Make your whole world about God. Um, so with that being said, um, many, many call themselves Christians, and, and they kind of walk in a place of it's like a daze walking through life of constant self-gratification. Now, I'm not pointing my finger at everybody else like they're messing up because this is something we're all prone to. And if you think that you don't do it, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. We as people, there's something in us that we just, we can be on fire for God, we can be singing with the whole heart, and then we just wake up one day and we're just in this daze of, you know, thinking that our whole world revolves around our money or doing the next home repair or our hobbies or you know, reading that next book. And it comes on us so suddenly, you know, and, and, and things that don't seem that bad. You know, watching your favorite show, playing your favorite video game, going on your favorite site on the internet, things that aren't, aren't bad, but then all of a sudden we just kind of, we warp it, and we, and we make it where our whole life suddenly revolves around that. Where now we're in our 30s or 40s and we're still staying in our house all day from video games. I mean, they, they just, see what I mean? Like, it, it ha we haven't transitioned to the idea of our whole life has to revolve around God. And that sounds like a really big, really big commitment, and it is. That's why Jesus said, whoever wants to follow me has to, they, they, they can't look back. This is an all-in kind of deal. And that's what Jesus is saying here. It, it's an all-in kind of thing. And uh, that's a very terrifying thing. Because I think there resides in many of us, even myself from time to time, this kind of idea that what if I go all in and I don't see anything for my, for my effort. What if I go all in in Jesus and I'm wrong? What if I go all in for Jesus and I didn't get to enjoy my life? And I know that some of you might say, well, that sounds awful selfish. Well, there is selfishness in each one of us. We could either pretend it doesn't exist and pretend to be holier than everybody else, or we can be real with ourselves and with others and say, yeah, there's selfishness in me. How much of you would just sign anything that would say, all your problems will end today, your entire family will get saved today, and you will never have any more problems? Just signing on the dotted line. Sign up. See, that's human nature. We desire self-gratification. It's something that always rests in us. And God says, oh, I have this plan for you. And you're just like, but my, <coughs> my plan sounds safer. And your plan sounds a little bit dangerous. Your plan seems like I'm going to need a four-wheeler. And, and my plan seems like I need maybe just a skateboard or a scooter. Mm -hmm. So maybe we need to like meet up here, God, because I don't think we're seeing eye to eye. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, if, if we were just be real with ourselves sometimes, we, we try and, and, and grow and, and grow as a stronger Christian, but then we try and hide from these things that we're actually thinking. All my all my life as a, as a kid, I always tried to convince God that I was better than I was because I was afraid if He knew who I really was. If he knew my reserves about following him, if he knew why I was scared to give my whole life to him, that maybe, maybe he wouldn't love me. See what I mean? And I, and I think that sometimes we, we try so hard to run from the reality of who we are <laughs> that we're never able to take that to God and find the healing that he wants to give us. So we walk around our lives damaged, but afraid to admit it to God when he knows all along. And I just imagine the stupidity of that. So Jesus' emphasis in this part is not stop doing, but replace with. It's, he's not telling you to just stop seeking things in the world. That's, that, that's one thing. He's saying stop and replace with seeking me instead. And then you go back to 24 and you realize that it really is an all-in kind of thing. No one can serve two masters. It is impossible to be a Sunday Christian. It is impossible, and I mean by that is where you'll read your Bible on Sunday, but then Monday through Saturday, you act like it doesn't exist. You know, 
Chuck and I have this CD. We, we both love it. It's by a band called DC Talk, which for some reason they broke up and I don't want to talk about it. I'm so bitter. And on, on <laughs> their, on, you know, really their best album, let's be honest, it was called Jesus Freak. Yes. And uh, yes. they said this thing, and, and Chuck has said it a, a bunch of times, and I'm going to say it again. You know, the single greatest cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge God with their lips and then just go on and act like nothing. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable, and I totally agree with that. We are too afraid to commit our whole lives to God, but then we want to look down on the world for acting like the world. Oh, those stupid Democrats, those stupid Republicans, those stupid these people, those, whoever our prejudice is against, whoever we have decided to single out and hate, those stupid people, because they don't conform to my idea of what I think the world should be like. If you seek God, you'll get stuff. That's what some people often take this passage to mean. But here's the thing. Now, I'll read that again. Okay? But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. If you are seeking the blessings that come from seeking God's kingdom, you're not seeking God's kingdom. You can't be seeking both. That's what he just said in verse 24. No one can serve two masters. So what we try and do is we try and make a prosperity gospel of it, like Benny Hinn did for many years. Uh, many of the televangelists that you see on TV, they, they, they taught this, that if you just, you know, do your basic, you know, I pay tithes, I go to church on a Sunday, then God's going to just, like, throw all your dream houses and everything at you. And that's exactly the opposite of what you think here, because if you're seeking God's kingdom so as to get something, then you're not seeking God's kingdom. In other words, you're just seeking your own pleasure, and you'll probably find yourself not seeking anything. So there's just a few things uh, I want to say. Before I go to the next thing, you know, you become who you are. I'm sorry, you become who you're around with. I said that wrong. It was, it said it was right up here, <laughs> but it was wrong here. Uh, you become who you hang around with. If you're hanging around with people who don't live for God, you're not going to live for God. You know, I see a lot of people who try and help drug addicts and then get caught in the same attitude problems that the drug addicts are in. I see people who try and help people and then they, they start getting sucked in. In fact, in counseling, they have this thing. It's called, um, oh my goodness. When you're counseling someone, I forget what the term they use is, but oftentimes their attitude can, can, can start tearing you down uh, where you get kind of um, overwhelmed. I forget. Transference. Thank God. Thank God. Yes, that's what I've been trying to say. But I've been stumbling around up here. Transference. It's this thing called transference. And it, it, <laughs> thank God for Lauren, huh? And uh, well, anyways, you know what I'm saying there. Just watch who you're hanging around with. Because I've seen some people think, oh, they're not going to affect me. I'm a strong Christian. And then they start, you know, getting off. And well, you kind of look like that. Well, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. And then you start hearing them bad mouth the pastor, and you're like, well, what happened here, buddy? You... I just think that he's doing some things wrong. Well, okay, all right, but maybe watch your attitude. You know, everybody messes up sometimes. Maybe you're right. And then you hear them more, and they start talking real hateful towards the pastor and about the pastor. And it's like, oh, well, this is starting to look bleak. So then you try and talk to them about it again, and now all of a sudden they have a problem with the whole church. Well, what happened? You become who you hang around with. You can't hang around rebellious people and not get rebellious. I mean, it's just something that happens. Uh, I think more could be said there, but I'm probably will take me off, off where I don't need to go. So there's two things that I want to point out with this. First off, he says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So the first thing, his kingdom, that's kind of like our motives. Okay? What I mean by that is, okay, seek first his kingdom. Well, how do you seek first his kingdom? That talks about your motives behind what you do. If you're seeking first his kingdom, that means when I stop on the side of the road to help somebody who's broken down, I'm not doing it for glory. I'm not doing it so people will notice me or so that I can have a story to tell on Sunday. I'm doing it because I see someone in need. Yes. That's my motive, yes. right? Yes. So that's seeking, that's seeking first his kingdom. But then the second thing that he says in verse 33 is seek first his righteousness. Now, that's a little bit different. That's our actions. So... Seeking his kingdom, that more deals with 
or the intention of why we're doing something. Uh, and, and seeking his righteousness, that more deals with what we do or don't do. And so kind of the idea of what, what am I doing? So think of it like that. My mind and my hands kind of maybe helps get the point across here of what I'm trying to say. Um, and I don't really want to get too far because once, once, once again, the really don't have time to talk about everything here, but when he says, and all these things will be added to you, long story short, without going into that, because that's a whole different sermon, uh, <laughs> um, it's kind of the idea of where God guides, he will provide. That's kind of the idea. He's not saying nobody will ever starve to death who loves God. He's not saying that. He's not saying nobody who loves God will ever experience bad health. He's not saying you'll ever, you know, not have clothes. It, it, it's a whole long thing, and I don't really have time to get into it. But the idea is that this, as God guides you, he will provide for you. Okay, and I can tell you numerous stories of missionaries who were called to go to a place, and they went, and God provided miraculously. And I can tell you stories in this church, not just way off somewhere else. Um, so I just clarify that without getting off on it. Um, so... These, th this thing of seeking God, it, it, it's good, but it's also related to the other three commands that we're going to be looking at. Now, those uh, other three commands are giving, praying, and going. So if you seek with, if you seek God while giving, I'm talking about of your money, of your time, it'll help you to not be focused on temporary possessions. If you seek God while praying, it will show you what to seek, and it will equip you to seek. And if you seek God while going, and by going I mean reaching out to others, loving people, serving people, it is the result of seeking God's kingdom. They're all connected. If you really want to seek God with your whole heart, your motives and your actions, you have to give. Give of yourself, give of your money, give of your time, empty yourself. You cannot possibly seek God if you're seeking your own kingdom too. Then if you're seeking God, you also have to be praying. Sometimes people say, well, I'm seeking God. You know, I, I just, I've been going to church. Are you praying? Well, you know, I have my five-minute nighttime prayer. That's not going to get it done. You have to be praying. Jesus said it like this, you know, hey, watch out and pray. Because, you know, temptations are going to come and really need to be on your guard. And he was praying for at least two or three hours that night, so you have to figure he kind of meant, you know, this is an actual activity. Um, and so all these things are, are, all these four commands that we're going to be looking at over the next next three weeks are, are very connected. Seeking God, giving, praying, and going. So praying would be, here are some examples maybe, um, that you would be able to do your ministry without attitude. It's easy to do a ministry and feel like this. They sure are lucky to have me. Yes. Or you start looking at somebody else's ministry and you say, man, oh man, if they would just do it this way, it would be a lot more efficient. And you start nitpicking people. Praying helps that not to happen. Also, praying helps you to actually see the lost and the hurting and especially those that you can't reach. Praying helps you see people that you cannot reach. That's right. Never forget that. And then when I talk about going, there's a lot of different things that could be said there. I'll, I'll skip past it. I, we'll, we'll look at that and probably next week or the week after. I'm, I'm probably going a little bit too long today. So as an example for what this is like, think of it kind of like seeking God is like the game. It's like the, 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 the soccer, for instance, uh, or football. Giving is kind of like clearing your head, getting your head in the game. And praying is kind of like finding out where the goal is. And the going, the serving people, the actual following through with seeking that's kind of like scoring a point. Does that kind of help with the imagery here? They're all connected. And when you try and seek God without serving people, without going, you're not really seeking God. If you try to seek God while holding back your money and your time from Him, you're not really seeking God. I mean, imagine this. That God 
created everything. He, he really doesn't need our money. It's an attitude of our own heart. And when we refuse to give our money to him, basically we're, what we're saying is that's, that's my money. But God has given and God takes away. You see, I mean, you, you, can't, you can't say that you're seeking God if you're kind of seeking your own self. So there's just a few, a few minor things I want to say before we go to the finally. Uh, never, God never promises that we can live however we want. He never promises that we'd be able to retire in peace. He never promises we'd be able to surround ourselves with things and have everything we wanted in our perfect dream house on the beach. He never promises those things. The thing is, we kind of put our own modern spin on passages that we want to put our own modern spin on so that maybe we can justify sitting in our wealth. And you know, if you look at if you look at world economics and you see how fortunate even the poorest of us in America are, and then you go over and you look at like, for instance, a lot of places in Africa, you know, it, it's very uh, heartbreaking. You know, I was reading this one report, and uh, these kids in, um, oh my goodness, I don't think it was Haiti, I think it was uh, Puerto Rico, but it could have been Haiti. I always could, I know that sounds stupid, but I get the two islands confused. In. One of the islands, the kids um, didn't have enough to eat, and so they were giving their kids the mud from the beach to eat to fill up their stomachs. You know, it's, it's very easy to, to, to complain here in America because our house isn't as nice as somebody else's house or our car isn't as nice as somebody else's car. You know, maybe we want more and more and more. And then we start looking at other people's problems and it's like, ah. And what's even worse is the attitude that they have where they just have this great attitude and then we're complaining about our cars and it's like, oh, oh, that hurts. Mm, that hurts. And if it doesn't hurt you, man, oh man. Well, it should. There are some things in life that just should hurt a little bit. Yes. God's followers obey him, and that means having a concern for eternity. You know, my life isn't about my job. Think about this, okay? You die today, your company replaces you within a week. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Work. Be a good worker. But remember, your life is more than work. Yep. Pay your bills on time. All, the, all great things. But remember, your life is more than bills. Take care of your car. Take care of your things. But remember, life is more than things. Remember that. There's this American desire that's kind of like a cancer for continual gratification. And the more we feed this monster of uh, making ourselves more and more happy and more, more gratified, the less happy we are. And it's like a cancer. We try, we try and get rid of it by feeding it, and it's just not working. The better way is to seek God's kingdom. That's the better way. And this is just a few things on a final note here. If you don't seek God's kingdom, you will seek yours. Yes. That is the result that will happen. People, everybody think, thinks that they're the exception to the rule. No, I'm okay, I can do this. Okay, well tell me how that goes in five years from now. You're gonna find yourself farther away from God and not impacting anybody else but yourself. It's just not gonna work. I've done it myself. I've seen other people do it. I've never once seen it work where you're able to not seek God's kingdom without seeking your own kingdom. It just doesn't work. Um, and not seeking God's kingdom has its own little problems that it carries. Loss, doubt, anxiety, bondage, addiction, no joy in life. It takes you to a place you never thought you'd be. Especially, I see a lot of um, older Christians do this. You know, they... Well, I've known God for forever, and then they start gossiping and complaining and backbiting and causing problems in churches and trying to drive off pastors and going from thing to thing to thing about all the things that they don't like and how the church needs to change everything to make them feel better about not growing up after 40 years. And after all that, first off, they usually leave anyways, but then second off, they find themselves in a place that they never thought they'd be. Oh, but I love God. I've seeked him my whole I've sought him my whole life. So how'd you get here? So I mean, this really is an all-in kind of thing. A simple way you can see God's um, God's kingdom, just two very, very simple ideas. First off, in, in sacrificing your comfort to invite people to come to church or to spend time with you or, you know, getting involved in their lives. 
making an effort to leave your comfort zone to affect somebody else's life. That's just a real easy thing you can do, and you don't have to do it, do it all the time. Just edge your foot into the door. If you're antisocial like I am, this is a very big step. If you're very extroverted like my dad, it's really a small step. <laughs> uh, you know, I see him just walking up to people and talking to them I'm like, "Stop!" Then they'll know who we are. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, uh, so just there's the idea. It's a real simple. It, 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 it takes a measure of leaving your comfort just to do a very simple thing like get to know someone. Very difficult for a lot of, especially my generation. You know, we grew up with with. Well, not so much my generation as the generation after me. Grew up with, you know, with technology and, and all those kids had smartphones and everything. They're not used to really one on one. Yeah. They're having a really hard time with the idea of, you know. And I know the older people probably have a little bit less of a hard time, but <coughs> for us young people, we probably have a harder time, I know. Um, and young adults, we've actually been focusing a lot on um, tactics to get out of our comfort zone and to stop being so introverted and, you know, interact with people. Because, you know, you will have depression if you don't interact with people. That's just yeah, a fact of life. And then here's just another real real easy idea. Keep an eye out for people in need, and then help them. I mean, there's people in need all around us, just little things. You don't have to, you don't have to, you know, change where every waking moment, you're over in somebody else's yard doing house repairs or something. See what I mean? I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not saying you can't ever do anything to unwind or something you enjoy. I'm not saying that at all, but there are people all around us who need help. You know, there's a lot of people who have, have had surgeries and they can't get out of their house. Well, one of the things that we've been talking about in young adults is, is maybe um, picking up their groceries for them. Uh, we're actually in the middle of setting some, a couple things up with uh, meeting people's needs. Another thing is elderly people who can't take care of their yards anymore um, because of failing health and maybe they don't have the funds. Uh, going over and, and, and helping them with that. That's actually something we're in the process of getting started within the next couple of weeks. And, um, you know, that's just what the young, young adults are doing. I'm, just, you know, I, I, I'm so proud of my young adults. Uh, they, they've been really working hard at, you know, inviting people and getting to know people. And, and these are these are people who barely went to went to church, and when they did, they didn't talk to people. Right. Well, now, I mean, things are a lot different now. Nicole, for instance, she's not here tonight. Um, she's in the middle of a move. She's probably doing something with that. But uh, you know, when I first met her, very uh, very closed off, kind of quiet girl, and uh, you know, now she's doing all kinds of stuff. Um, what was it just the other day that she was telling me about? Um, oh, what was it? Man, she she tells me like every week she's got something else that she's been working on. And I'm just so proud of my young adults. These are introverts who are now reaching out and uh, and seeing yeah. people and seeing little things that they could do. Things like just carrying on a conversation that they wouldn't do before. Now you might think, well, that's a little thing, but to that person that they talk to, it was actually kind of a big thing. Our our society is very um, torn apart, very fragmented. And sometimes little conversations make a big difference to people. You know, I remember one time I went over to a widow's house and I was talking to her and when I went to leave, she was so happy that I came over because nobody talked to her anymore. Her husband died and she spent all of her time with her husband and nobody talked to her anymore. You know, little conversations like that just, it, it doesn't mean a whole lot to us, but to them it really does. And uh, man, it's gonna bug me not remembering that thing I was gonna say about, um, Yeah, I'll remember. No, I'll remember tonight. As soon as we say amen, I'll remember. When we pray tonight, oh, yeah. uh, I'll remember that. Uh, man. Okay, well, if I, if, if I try too hard, I'm going to start blowing some Jesus here, guys. Uh, uh, so we're just going to go ahead and pretend like I told you that she did something really great, like built the Hoover Dam by herself. And then when you see her next week, just say, wow, man, that's a really, really amazing job. Dad. That's a lot of water to divert and all that stuff. Cool. Uh, man, you really hate that. If I remember, guys, I will write it on a piece of paper, and next Sunday night I will tell you about it. Oh, man. Golly, that's going to bug me. Anyways, get back on the thing here. We're going to go ahead and, cl and close out in prayer. Um, so if you'll